Hollywood, California, Monday, January 18th. <laughs> the Lux Radio Theater presents Edward G. Robinson in Criminal Code with Beverly Roberts, Paul Gilfoyle, and Noel Madison. Lux presents Hollywood. Our stars, Edward G. Robinson, Beverly Roberts, Paul Gilfoyle, and Noel Madison. Our guests, James B. Hollihan, recent warden of San Quentin Prison, and Gladys Lloyd, former stage star, and now Mrs. Edward G. Robinson. Our producer, Cecil B. DeMille. Our conductor, Louis Silvers. Once again, the makers of Lux Flakes welcome you all to another hour in Hollywood at the Lux Radio Theater. Every woman should know what Lux Flakes can do for her hands. Think of the time your hands are in the dishpan every day. The wrong soap can do a lot of damage. It may contain harmful alkali that dries up the oils which protect your skin and keep it soft. Then your hands look red, rough, and old. Lux Flakes contain no harmful alkali. They are like a beauty care for your hands. Yet Lux for all your dishes costs less than one cent a day. Keep your hands lovely. Start using Lux for dishes tomorrow. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. <laughs> Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. What Mark Twain said about the weather of New England may be said about the character of Edward G. Robinson. It has a sumptuous variety that compels the stranger's admiration. His first success as an actor came in a vaudeville sketch which he wrote himself. It was followed by a brilliant career on the stage, including ten productions of the New York Theatre Guild, topped by his appearance in the title role of the Kibitzer, of which he was co-author. After a friendship of several years, I've learned that Mr. Robinson speaks seven languages, owns one of the finest private collections of modern art in this country, can put an egg in his mouth and turn a handspring without cracking the shell. Also, he is a heavy drinker of milk. Qualifies as an expert on diamonds, consults his wife regarding every part he's offered, and is a profound lover of good music. Mr. Robinson's next film is Kid Galahad. We hear him tonight as Martin Brady. The part of Robert Graham is taken by Paul Guilfoyle, heard recently from our stage in Men in White. Beverly Roberts descendant of Edward Jenner, who discovered smallpox vaccine, dropped her ideas of doing medical research herself to join the civic repertoire of Eva Legallia. Abroad and practically penniless, she sang songs in a Paris cafe for five francs and two meals daily. Later, she was singing in a New York nightclub when a scout from Warner Brothers heard her. Rushed to Hollywood, Miss Roberts has made five pictures in nine months and is currently starred in God's Country and the Woman. Tonight, she becomes Mary Brady, the warden's daughter. Noel Madison plays the part of Galloway. Thus acquainted, we now present our stars in person. Ladies and gentlemen, Edward G. Robinson, Beverly Roberts, Paul Guilfoyle, Noel Madison in the Lux Radio Theater production of Martin Flavin's play, Criminal Code. Saturday night crowd in Spelvin's place, a cafe of doubtful reputation. Seeming curiously out of place in these surroundings is Bob Graham, a well-bred, good-looking young fellow of 22. He dances with a girl who looks up at him through half-closed eyes. Well, music, ain't it? Yeah, it's, it's awful hot in here, though. <laughs> Want to go outside for a walk? Who, me? No, I'm all right. Atta, baby. You know, it was swell of you to bring me here. I mean, not knowing me, hardly and all. Oh, it was swell of you. Ah. Uh, I mean it. What's your name? Bob. Bob Graham. Hey, there's that fellow again. Who? The fellow's been staring at you all the time. Oh, don't pay no attention to him. Do you know him? Oh, yes, in a way. His name's Parker. I don't like the way he's looking at you. It's, it's insulting, like, like he owns you. Oh, forget it. Come on back to the table. Yeah, 
feel all right now? Well, sure, I'm okay. Uh, hello, Gertie. Oh, hello, Mr. Parker. Having a good time? Sure, why not? <laughs> well, come on over to my table. I got a party there. Thanks, but I'm with Mr. Graham. Sorry. Oh, come on. Come on now. Keep your hands to yourself. <laughs> hey, just a minute, Mr. Parker. What? If the lady wants to go with you, it's all right. But if she wants to stay here, she's going to stay. Hey, listen, kid, I know her. She'll go where the cash is easiest. Why, you... You take that back. You apologize, you hear? Beat it, kid. Apologize. Go on before you get in trouble. Come on, Bob. Let's get out of here. You're staying, Gertie. Sit down. Take your hands off of your dirty... Why, you... Look out! He's got a gun! (laughs) What happened? He hit him with a bottle. Come on, get out, Bob. Get out. No, no. Say, say, what's the matter? What started this fight? I see the boss's fellow here. He hit Mr. Parker with a bottle. He, He insulted this lady. I didn't mean to hurt him, but... He reached for a gun. I thought he... Yeah? Well, hold on to this guy, Eddie. I'll get the cops. Hello, District Attorney's office. Hello, Mr. Brady's wire is busy now. Hello, District Attorney's office. Mr. Brady is busy just now. Will you hold on? All right, what about it? Only happened Saturday night. Give me a chance. Yeah, I'll see the kids in a couple of minutes. We'll have a statement by noon. Reporters. How they love the smell of blood. You can't blame them, Mr. Brady. Parker's old man's a big shot in this town. Yes, I know. Any more witnesses, Lou? Let's see. The waiter, the girl, the manager. You've seen them all, Mr. Brady. Yeah, seven eyewitnesses. And they all check on material points. Open and shut case, eh? Yeah, like a knife. If young Parker should die, we've got Parker a Parker case... is dead. Dead? Yes? Yeah. What is it, Mr. Brady? Second-degree murder? Well, it might be at that. All right, in here, young fella. Here he is, Mr. Brady. Uh, okay, Mike. Sit down, kid. I, uh, I'd rather stand, sir. Yeah? Have a cigar? No, thank you. Cigarette? No, sir. Right, don't you smoke? Yes, sir, but I don't care to now. Oh, I see. Well, uh, what's your name? Robert Graham. Yeah? Do they ever call you Bob? Yes, sir. Where do you live? 2912 32nd Avenue. Boarding house, huh? Yes, sir. Where do you come from? Hood Valley. Parents? My mother. Yeah. Well, uh, what you been doing here? I, uh, I was a clerk at Price and Hatton's, the brokers. How long? A month. I only been here that long. Ever been arrested before? Oh, no, sir. Yeah. Well, Bob, you're in a jam. Yes, sir. Young Parker died early this morning. Huh? Oh, my God. You like a drink, Bob? No, sir. Ah, good boy. Now, look here, Bob. You can make a statement to me if you want to. But anything you say may be used against you. I want you to understand that. Yes, sir. Now, it looks to me like the best thing for you to do is to come clean. Plead guilty and take a jolt. Yes, but your lawyer might advise you differently. Oh, have you got a lawyer? Well, the, the firm I work for sent their lawyer to see me this morning. What did he say? He, uh, he told me not to talk. Yeah? Well, now, then, don't you say a word. Now, you haven't said anything yet that'll do you any harm. And I guess that's all. Tough luck, Bob. Now, that's the way things go. That's the way they break sometime. You have to take them the way they fall. Yes, sir. All right, Mike, take them out. Come on, kid. Uh, stuff, Lou. Yeah. You know, that kid's got a nice personality. Yeah. A smart criminal lawyer like Kelly or Goldsmith could make it pretty tough for us. That's right, Mr. Brady. Hey, if that kid belonged to me, I'd make a plea of self-defense and fight it out. But Parker didn't have a gun. Yeah, but the kid thought he had. He thought he was fighting for his life. It's what you think that counts. That Parker guy wasn't worth a lead nickel and that girl less. I'd get a disagreement at the worst, a year's delay, and a new trial. I'd get him off. He'd never serve a day. Yeah, I guess you could, Mr. Brady. A thing like this could... Well, it could happen to anyone. Me, you, anyone. Just a rotten break, that's all. What do you suppose he'll get? No, I can't tell. If that lawyer of his knows anything, <laughs> he won't, though. Corporation man. Well, I'd advise him to plead the kid guilty to manslaughter and let it go at that. Manslaughter? Ten years, eh? Yeah, maximum. That's tough on the kid. He'll go to pieces in the jug, wreck his whole life. Now, that's the old mosaic law. A knife for a knife. The basis and foundation of our criminal code. 
There's a man lying dead. His skull, skull smashed in with a bottle. And somebody's got to pay. Well, that somebody happens to be Bob Graham. Robert Graham, manslaughter, ten years, number 23499. Have him photographed and fingerprinted. Here, 82, cell 6. Number 23499. Manslaughter, ten years. Previous occupation, broker's clerk. Put him in the jute mill. We can't use any more clerks. Two, three, four, nine, nine. Soiled six out of ten. Needs medical attention. Send him over to the lab. Have Dr. Ryan give him an examination. All right. You can put on your shirt now. You're not sick, do you understand? You say you have no appetite. You can't sleep. But physically, you're not sick. Now, what do you say, Dr. Kellogg? Nothing physically wrong. You see, I can find nothing wrong with you. My assistant can find nothing wrong with you. You're neurotic. Outside, I should prescribe a change in mountains of the sea. It's not medicine you need, you understand. Look at me. Look at me, I say. How long have you been here? Six years. Ah. You can go. Jute Mill. Six years. You can see it in his eyes. Environmental. Mechanistic occupation. Neurotic. Heaven knows what else. Ah, but you can't find them with a stethoscope, eh, Doctor? As you say, Dr. Reinwald. It's a pity. Yes. A pity. There's something there worth saving... And it's almost gone. This is the medical lab, Mart. Hello, Dr. Ironwolf. Want you to meet new warden, Mart Brady. Uh, how are you, Doctor? How do you do? You remember Brady, Doc. Used to be district attorney. Ought to be governor of the state by rights, hmm? <laughs> well, you're a little early, Mac. <laughs> I'm showing Mr. Brady around the prison, Doc. Thought we'd drop in and say hello. Of course. Regular hospital here, Mart. Drug store, x-rays, operating rooms, everything. You ought to see it. Uh, better get going now, though. We've got to see the jute mill before the whistle blows. So long, Doc. See you later. Well, I'm glad to have met you, Doctor. Thank you. I'd like to see you all around your plant sometime. I'd be very glad to show you, well, That's fine. If there's anything I can ever do to help you, just let me know. Thank you. I will. There. Take a slant at that. Some factory, eh? 5,000 bales per day. 5,000? Why not? There's 2,500 men in here. Speed them up. Make the crooks earn their keep, that's what I say. Well, that's pretty <laughs> tough on them, isn't it? Tough? Ah, uh, they like it, Mart. Give them something to do, something to think about. Yeah, I guess so. You see that word, Mart, the fellow down there by the machine? Yeah. That's Jim Fale. Jim Fale? Yeah, yeg man, train robber, sharp as a trap and slippery as an eel. One of the worst we got. It takes two cards to hold his record. Yeah. Say, who? who's that kid working next to him? Huh? Oh, I don't know. Just a punk, I guess. Well, not such a good idea, is it, letting a young kid mix with the hardened criminals? Oh, uh, what's the difference? They're all crooks, Mart, every one of them. Yes. Well, let's go. You'll want to see them eat their supper, Mart. It's quite a sight, I'll tell you. And right after supper, we stick them in the cells. This is the new cell block right here, Mart. You see those men standing in line outside the cages? Yeah. When the bell rings again, you'll see a funny thing, Mart. Yeah, what are they doing there? Mm, anything they like. Talk, smoke, read, play cards, anything. Till nine o'clock. No, oh, that's tough. That's pretty tough. No, no, they like it. They're champing at the bit to get in now. Keep your eyes open, Mart. Mark time. Now. <laughs> System, Mart, system, you see? One lever locks the door of every set. Yeah? 
Hey, tell me, are those floodlights on all night? Hmm? Why, sure. Lights is the enemy of crooks, you well, know. How do the men sleep in that light? Why, they... Oh, they get used to it. Uh, come on, Mart. I want to see your daughter and your sister. Then I've got to beat back to town. You see, Mart, you've got to Ah, oh, gee. If they'd only put out those lights and let a guy sleep. You're asleep, Bob? Bob. No. Need something to read? I got a paper here. I don't want to read. You used to be reading all the time. Want to play a game of pinochle or dominoes? No. No, no. I can't. I can't go on with it. I can't. I won't. Let me out. Let me out. Let me out. Stop. Stop. No, no, no. Hot that up. Quiet, Bob. Quiet. Steady now. Steady, I say. They'll jerk you out of here and throw you in the cooler just that quick. You've got to pull yourself together, Bob. I can't. I wish I was dead. I wish I was in hell. You've got your wish, son. It's tough, kid. I... I'll tell you something, Bob. I didn't mean to tell you this at all. But I can't stand by and see you go to smash. Bob, I'm going to make a break for it. You are? Why not? It's the only chance I've got. Oh, take me with you, Jim. You think it over, kid. It's always a long shot. Nine out of every ten come back. I don't care, Jim. If I could only get one breath of air outside. One good square meal. If, if I could only see a woman's face again. I know, but think it over, Bob, and take your time. But when? And how? Well, there's four in on it now. Myself, Dutch Crask, Pete Grimes, and Runch. Runch? Well, I'm not very keen on him myself. I heard he's a stool. But he's a pal of Grimes, and Grimes has framed the trick. You'll take me with you. You will, won't you, Jimmy? Think it over, kid. Think it over. I tell you, Mary, this is no place for your father. He'll never be happy here. <laughs> a man who should be sitting in the governor's mansion. Well, stop it, Aunt Jenny. This is Dad's job now, and he's got to do it. But living here, inside the prison, I'll never get used to it. It gives me the creeps. And all the children put to bed for the night. You know where they are, Mark? Every one of them. <laughs> yeah, we know that. <laughs> Hello, Dad. Hello, Mary. Hello, Max. Well, Mary, how are you, dear? How are you, Miss Brady? I shall never get accustomed to this, Mr. McManus. Hmm? No, no, don't say that, Miss Brady. Oh, it's horrible. <laughs> horrible. Oh, Dad, before I forget, Dr. Reinwolf called. Yes? It's about some prisoner. He'd like you to see him personally. Here's the name. I wrote it down. Robert Graham, 23499. Recommend change of environment. Graham. That name's familiar. But... Hello? Call Dr. Reinwolf, please. Tell him I'll see that prisoner tonight. All right, I'll see him now. What is it? You have your dinner now, sir? Uh, yes. Uh, oh, uh, run along, Mary. I'll be with you in a minute. Come on, Auntie. You staying back? No, but I'll be up again soon. Goodbye, Mary. Bye, Miss Brady. Hmm. I'm afraid so. Hmm? <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, Mart, I'll say so long. Yeah. Uh, Mart, you won't mind a bit of advice from an old friend. Oh, no, no, no. What is it, Mac? I know there isn't much about crooks I could be telling you. <laughs> I guess not. You're a big man, Mart. Much too big a man for this job. It's only a temporary thing, I know. Oh, is it? Hmm? But I'm not kicking. You've got to play the cards the way they fall. They've shelved you for a while, but... Well, don't let anything go wrong in here. Don't let them get anything on you, Mark. Yes, I know, I know. There's only one way you can run a prison. Heels on their necks. Now, don't pay too much attention to Reinwolf. He's a good doctor, but he's a nut. He's full of theories about this and that. Yeah? Now, Captain Gleason, he's your best bet. Level-headed, cold as ice. And he knows the game from A to Z. Eternal vigilance. That's the ticket. Don't let him pull any monkey tricks. Yes, I'll take care of it. A jailbreak or a killing, Mart. You know what that would mean. Sure. 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 Well, well, I've got to beat it or I'll miss my train. Goodbye and good luck, Mart. Thanks, Mac. So long. So long, Mac. Come in. Come on. Come on. In you go. Evening, Warden. Good evening, Captain. Here's number 23499, Warden. Dr. Reinwolf said you'd see him. That's right. Here's his record, sir. Oh, thanks. Uh, sit down, Graham. Your name is Graham, isn't it? Look up here. Do they ever call you Bob? Do you hear the warden talking to you? Oh, now, easy, Gleason. 
Uh, Bob, I uh, <clears throat> I don't know what you're here for. These guys don't tell much of a story, it's but... It's the uh... Parker case, Mr. Brady. Parker? Yes, sir. Young Parker that was killed six years ago. Yeah? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I remember now, Pa. Well... <laughs> Well, uh, Dr. Reinwald recommends a change of environment. I guess he means to take you out of the jute mill. Would you like that, Bob? Would you? I don't care. You can do what you want. How would you like to be my chauffeur? I need one. I don't care. Dad, we're waiting... Oh. I didn't know you were busy. Well, that's all right, Mary. This is Bob Graham. He's going to be our chauffeur. Oh. Are you? Well, I... I'm... I'm sure you'll be a good one. Thanks. Thank you. I... I'll do my best. Ah, uh, good boy. We'll get along all right, won't we, son? I sure we'll get along fine. We will continue with Edward G. Robinson in Criminal Code shortly from the Lux Radio Theater. But for the moment, let us imagine we're in a typical American home in which we meet two members of our unseen radio audience. In the living room in front of an open fire, the Murrays are listening to our performance of The Criminal Code. Powerful play, isn't it, George? I certainly enjoy the Lux Radio Theater. Yes, so do I. And we're in the front row pretty regularly. That's right. You know, George, I've been enjoying the shows more lately. I haven't had a lot of odd jobs to do while I listen. Yes, my dear, you do seem to have more time to take it easy now. Well, one thing, that mending basket isn't nearly so full these days. (laughs) Uh... Matter of fact, I can thank Lux for that, too. Mm -hmm. Why, since I began washing socks and stockings in Lux flakes, I haven't had to do anywhere near so much darning. Your socks wear much longer, and I haven't had a stocking run in ages. Lux flakes do cut down on tiresome darning. You don't have to mend nearly so many stocking runs or holes in the menfolk socks either. That's because Lux saves the elasticity of the threads. Instead of breaking so easily under strains, the threads can give. They can stretch, then spring right back into shape. Naturally, you don't get nearly so many runs or holes. So, to keep your stockings and your husband's socks in good condition longer, always use Lux Flakes. Once again, Mr. DeMille. We continue with Criminal Code, starring Edward G. Robinson with Beverly Roberts, Paul Guilfoyle, and Noel Madison. Six months have passed. Prison routine has droned endlessly on, interrupted only by Jimmy Fale's futile break for freedom. In the living room of the warden's apartment, Mary is fastening the buckles of a suitcase. Dr. Reinwolf appears in the archway. Oh, excuse me. Yes? Oh, Dr. Reinwolf, come in. Uh, Miss Brady, your father tells me you're going away. Oh, just for a week or ten days. Won't you sit down? Oh, thank you. No, I'm sorry that you're going, even for so short a time. The miracle that you performed in six short months... Miracle? Yes. The reconstruction of a man. Oh. You mean Bob. Bob Graham. Yes. Well, what have I to do with that? I don't know. A curious phenomenon. The raising of Lazarus from the dead wasn't more curious. The prison takes six years to break a man and... and something mends him in six months. And is he mended, do you think? Oh, can't you see that in his eyes? Uh, From my own records, I've taken the trouble to investigate his history and... uh, and his crime. Yes? It wasn't a crime at all. It was an accident. Oh. I thought perhaps you might care to see the file. Oh, yes. Yes, I would. It's in this envelope. Um, your father was state's attorney at the time. No doubt he can confirm or supplement the facts. My father is a just man, a kind man. The kindest man I've ever known. If you mean... Oh, nothing, nothing. Now, you quite misunderstand me. The, um, the integrity of our criminal code wasn't violated in this case. I see. Oh, excuse me, I... I came to get your grip, Miss Brady. Oh, yes, Bob, here it is. I'll take it out to the car. Thank you. Bob. Bob. Oh, hello, Galloway. Oh, they coming, kid? All right. Pretty soft now, eh? Working for the warden. Well, it's better. Yeah. They got me running errands for Gleason. The rat. Come here. 
Know what they did with Fails and Trask and Grimes for trying that break? No. Solitary for eight months. That's what they got. Eight months? Somebody's got to pay for that. Somebody will get that rotten squealer. Runch? Who else? There aren't walls thick enough nor guards enough to save his life. Oh, but he didn't know what he was saying, Galloway. They made him tell. They... I know what they did. But that don't let him out. Runch squealed. Turned up his pals. He's got to pay for that. But how? How should I know? But he's working up in the warden's office these days. So watch your step unless you want to get into a jam. I don't. But what? How? Keep clear of him, that's all. The guard's watching us. So long, Bob. So long, Galloway. Bags in the car, Miss Brady. Thank you, Bob. Will, uh, will you be gone long? Only a few days. Oh. Is there anything I can do for you, Bob, outside? No, thank you. Anyone I can see? No, there isn't anybody now. My mother died three years ago. Oh, I didn't know. She used to come and see me every month until she died. It, it kept my courage up. Afterwards, I, well, I began to slip, I guess. You know, it's awful hard to try and make yourself believe that it's worthwhile to try. I know. They all think they've had a rotten deal. That's all you hear. Bad luck, tough breaks. That's all they talk about. It gets under your skin in time, and it fills you up with bitterness and hate. That's all there is in here. Bob, are you bitter? No, not now. I was, but I seem to see more clearly now. My father's trying to get you parole. Yes, I know. But that doesn't matter so much to me now. Well, why do you say that? Oh, I mean, if, if you stay here. I mean, you don't mean that. Yes, I do. It isn't like it was before at all. If I can see you every day, just just to see you. Then when they lock me up at night, there's something to think about, to, to wait for until tomorrow. I... Bob, what will you do when you're free again? I don't know. I've thought a lot about it, too. Do you... Do you think it'll make any difference to people? What? That I've been in prison. It shouldn't. No, it shouldn't, should it? When a thing is paid for, that should end it, but... Well, they don't think that in here. They say it does. They say that's why so many who go out come back. Would... Would it make any difference to you? No, Bob. Mary. For heaven's sake, Mary, are you still here? Why, I'm just leaving out, Jenny. Goodbye. Goodbye, dear. Have a good time. Goodbye, Bob. I'll, uh, I'll walk to the car with you. Warden. Now, Ranch, what is it? Warden, I gotta speak to you. I gotta. Hey, what are you trembling about? I, I don't know. Oh, come on, come on. Pull yourself together, Ranch. There's eight feet of stone wall between you and the yard, and iron gates down there with guards on either side. Oh, they'll get me, so they'll get me. I know they will. Oh, can't you get me out of here? But I'm doing what I can. I never meant to squeal. I couldn't help myself. A guy that squeals in order to have a break, a chance for his life, or run for it. It's like the death house waiting here. Oh, you're off your you're off your nuts. Oh, come in, Bob. Yes. Sir. That's all, Ranch. You can go. Yes, Warden. You want to see me, sir? Yeah. I want to talk to you. Sit down, Bob. Thank you, sir. Bob, I'm trying to get you out of here. Yes, sir, I know. Now it isn't as easy as it sounds. The system's like a big machine. You go in one end and come out the other, see? Yes, sir. Now, you've done almost uh, seven years out of your ten. Your record's clean. You're eligible for parole. Now, I'm doing what I can to get you out. Yes, sir. You're pretty bitter, maybe. I don't know. No, sir. Not now. Ah, well, so much the better for you. Most prisoners are, and then the fight goes on forever. You only paid according to the law, that's all. The state's attorney has to fight like mad for that. For every man he puts behind the bars, a dozen slip between his fingers. He has to fight the press and maudlin public sentiment and... What's that? I think it's in the recreation yard behind the juvenile, sir. Yeah? A fight, maybe. Yeah? Well, wait here till I come back. Bob! Bob! What's that noise? What is it, Bob? I don't know, Runch. A fight, maybe. A f- it ain't a fight. It's something else, Bob. Oh, listen. I've never done any dirt. Uh, do you? You ain't got nothing against me, have you, Bob? No. Uh, give me a tip-off, kid. Have they got me framed? Are they going to get me, huh? I don't know. Oh, you do? You're down in the yard. You know what's going on. You're holding out on me. Oh, have a heart, kid. Have a heart. Give me a chance to break. Bob! 
Galloway, what are you doing here? Now, yeah, quick. Uh, do you, you ain't got nothing against me, have you, Bob? No. Then yeah. give me a tip off, kid. Have they got me framed? Are they going to get me, huh? I don't know. Oh, you do? You're down in the yard. You know what's going on. You're holding out on me. Oh, have a heart, kid. Have a heart. Give me a chance to break. Bob! Galloway, what are you doing? Get out quick. No, no. Don't go, Bob. Don't leave me. He's come to get me. Get out, Bob. Look, he's got a knife. He's got a knife. Oh, Galloway, you can't. Shut up and get out of here. Don't touch me. Let me go. You're going to get what's coming to you, you lion. Galloway, stop it. Well, Doctor, come on, come on. What is it? He's dead, Walton. Dead. Stabbed in the back. All right, Doc. Cover him up. I'll send for you later. I'll be in my office. Gleason. Yes, Warden? How did it happen? How could it happen? That commotion in the yard. They threw you out of here and gave it to him in the back. Yes, I know, but who? Who did it? If you ask me, Warden, it was that driver of yours that turned the trick. Young Graham. Graham? Oh, you're crazy, Gleason. Why would he? What was this to him? You never can tell what's working in their head. Oh, forget it. The bird who planned this trick came either from the prison corridor or from the hall. Graham! Go on, use your nut. I tell you, he didn't do it. He was here when you left. If he didn't murder Runch, he must know who did. Yeah. Yeah, I guess that's right, Gleason. I guess he does. So, uh, come in, Bob. Yes, sir. Oh, Gleason. Yes. You better round up the clerks in the turnkey's office. Check them all for bloodstains before they have a chance to wash them off. Right. Bob, come here. Look at me. You didn't kill Runch, did you? No, sir. Yeah, I didn't think you did. It was a skillful, crafty trick. They cleared the way to both those doors. They knew the racket in the yard would draw the saphead guard off the inner gate. They thought of everything except that you were in this room just before it happened. Now, who killed him, Bob? Who killed him? I, uh, I don't know. Yeah? I'm afraid you can't get away with that, my boy. I go out of this room and leave you here, and Runch is alive. When I come back, you're outside in the hall, white as chalk, and Runch is dead or dying. Now, you knew that, didn't you? Yes. Yes. And yet you say you don't know who did it. Now, you're lying, Bob. Lying to shield a murderer. A man who crept in here with a knife and struck that poor defenseless creature down. Is that worthwhile? A man is dead, Bob. The law says someone has to pay for that. I didn't kill him. Yes, I know that, Bob. I didn't even know. I wasn't even in on it. I'll swear to that. Yeah, yeah, sure, Bob. I understand that. But there'll be an inquest. An inquest? Yeah, that's right. The long arm of the law will reach right through these gates. The same law that's outside. You didn't think of that? No, sir. Now, what will you say to the coroner's jury then? Nothing. Oh, you can't get away with that. They'll yank you out of here and put you in the county jail. You might get ten or twenty years for that. No. Oh, now, sit down, my boy. Sit down. Now, I've got to tell you this. You've got to know. A free man has nine chances out of ten to cheat the law. But a prisoner hasn't one chance in a hundred. Opinion is against them from the start. They could indict you for this, Bob. Men have been hung on slimmer evidence. No, no. Yeah, that's right. Now, listen to this, Bob. Except that a prisoner serving a sentence for homicide who shall be convicted of murder shall be hanged. Now, that's our criminal code, Bob. I know, it's tough. It's tough, but you see the way things lie. So you, you, you better tell me, Bob. I can't do that. I can't. There's a law inside here, too. A man can do anything but squeal. He can't do that. I'll have to take my chance, I guess. Chance? You haven't got a chance. You're in the net. You're caught. You may get 10 or 20 years. But it isn't right. It isn't but fair. I can't keep you here what? with me. They'd never stand for that. You'd go back to the duke, man. No, 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 I can't. I won't. You see, you're up against it, boy. You've got to tell me. Now, who killed that man? Who killed him, Bob? Come on, come clean now. Speak up. Who killed him? Who, who, who? I don't know. Bob! Listen to me. You believe that I'm your friend, that I want to help you? I don't know. Well, I am. I am. Things have been tough for you, I know. It was a rotten piece of luck that sent you here. You've had another one now. But it's just the way things break sometimes. You, me, or anyone. You have to play the cards the way they fall. Now, who killed that man? You won't come through, huh? I can't. You'll trade your life away to live up to a code that's made by murderers and crooks to cheat the laws of honest men. You're not a crook. That's not your code. It's all I've had. No, this book here in my hand. This is your code and mine. You're not a crook. Don't turn one now. Don't turn your back on this. Who killed that man? No, I... 
I can't forget so quickly what I learned in there. I can't do it. I think it's right, their code for them. And I can't go back on it for them. I can't. I wouldn't be anything then, don't you see? Not anything. I... I'd be like that thing under the sheet there. No, no. Bob. Bob. Now, look here. Now, uh, I'll give you one more chance. I'll have your parole here next week. You'll be outside these walls. Free, do you understand? Yes. Yes, or rot here in this cage for three or ten or twenty years. A rope around your neck, perhaps. A jute mill every day, day in and day out, week in and week out, year in and year out. Jute, jute, the smell of it that turns you sick. The dungeon now. A bucket nearly seven days, cold slop, and bread and water in between. No ray of light, no air, no sound, no human voice. Black emptiness, that's all. No, for what? For what? The prison rules. A prisoner must obey. Come on now. Who killed that man? Who killed that man? Come on now. Think fast, Bob. Think fast. Who killed him? All right, take him away, Gleason. Put him in the dungeon. Lock him up. Yes, sir. Come on, get out on your way. He won't be so cocky in a week. Yeah, now wait. No violence to that boy. Let no one lay a hand on him. You understand? Yes. I'm doing this for him. For him. I've got to save him, do you see? To save him from himself. He's got to tell. He must. He must. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. This is KNX Los Angeles, the voice of Hollywood. We return shortly to our play, Criminal Code, starring Edward G. Robinson as Warden Brady. We hear next from a man who last April terminated nearly nine years of office as warden of the largest penitentiary in the United States, San Quentin. One time United States Marshal and County Sheriff, he is now State Senator James B. Holohan. The Lux Radio Theater takes you to the capital of California, Sacramento. There, under the high vaulted dome of the Capitol building, where the State Senate has just elected him chairman of its Committee on Prisons and Reformatories, the former warden interrupts affairs of state to speak to us. Ladies and gentlemen, we switch you from Hollywood to Sacramento in presenting the recent head of San Quentin Prison, Senator James B. Holohan. Thank you, Mr. DeMille, and my congratulations on your splendid production of Criminal Code. It was just two years ago last Saturday that the most exciting experience I had at, Sa at San Quentin occurred. I was seated with three members of the State Parole Board in my home, and the door suddenly opened, and we found ourselves facing four of the, our most desperate convicts, each armed with a forty-five automatic. They were Rudolph Strick, Fred Landers, Alec McKay, and Joe Christie. I dashed to the telephone to sound the alarm, but as I did, Straight rushed up from behind and pounded me unconscious with the butt of his gun. Then they forced one of the others to order a prison car. Just then, my wife entered the room and was promptly made a prisoner as she vainly strived to persuade the convicts to abandon their mad scheme. The car arrived, taking the three members of the parole board and the driver as hostages. <clears throat> they made a wild dash through, through the prison gates. Police bullets stopped the car 50 miles north of San Francisco. Rudolph Strait was slain. And the other three brought back and tried. McKay and Christie were executed, and Fred Landers is still in San Quentin, sentenced for life. They had secured their guns from an outside Confederate who had hidden them under the hood of an automobile belonging to a state employee. The four convicts gained access to the prison garage, so it was easy for them to pick up the automatics brought to their hands by a perfectly innocent man. By far, the majority of convicts realize their mistakes and try to serve their time in peace and obedience. I am a firm believer in strict discipline, but I found 
that prisoners, like all human beings, respond best to encouragement when deserved. A pat on the back, so to speak, can be just as effective as the most severe punishment in Siberia, our word for solitary confinement. At times, their makeups are strange. Two men about to die for murder once gave their money, in each case amounting to about $800, to charity. One to the Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, the other to children of another convict. It is impossible for prison authorities alone to rehabilitate men whom society has failed to save in the first place. Society always hesitates to help those who wear the prison brand. Until this is overcome, our job of rehabilitation can never fully succeed. Thank you and good night. Thank you, Senator Holohan. Back to Hollywood and Criminal Code, starring Edward G. Robinson with Beverly Roberts, Paul Guilfoyle, and Noel Madison. A week has gone by. A week Graham has spent in the darkness, solitude, and horror of a cell beneath the ground. During their hour of exercise, his fellow convicts mill aimlessly about in the prison yard. Then Galloway, lurking in the shadow of a wall, hails a white-faced prisoner. Jerry. Jerry. Over here. Oh, Galloway. You're late. Yeah, I know. I couldn't help it. The warden's daughter just got back. I had to carry a grip from the car. Hey, uh, I only got a minute, Galloway. That's time enough. Now listen to me. When you go back to the garage, go past the cookhouse, see? You meet Joe McNamee. You stop and speak to him, understand? Yeah. And slip him this. A knife. Take it, take it. The shoemaker's knife. Hey, how did you get it? Never mind. It's for Bob Graham. For him? Hey, how could they get a knife down there? I've heard of putting things in bucket fees. Slip them right through six-foot walls. Oh, yeah, yeah, but oh, it's an awful chance, Galloway. Well, what of it? Have you ever been down there where he is? No. Well, I have. I know what it's like. Gleason's been going down there 20 times a day, beating them up, trying to pry it out of him. Yeah, but a knife, what good's a knife to him? Not much, maybe. But it's an out. A two-way out. To end the torture or... Yeah, yeah. And the kid's been game. Dead game. We... We own something. Oh, yeah. Sometimes I... I feel like... Like what? Nothing. Go on, the guard's looking at us. Are you wish to see me, Warden? Uh, yes, uh, yes I do, Doctor. Come in. I want to ask you about Graham. Now, I looked him over this morning, as you ordered. Physically, of course... A week of bread and water in the dark has an effect. Deterioration does occur, but... But I'm less concerned with that than... Than what? Well, I mean the spirit, the morale, the man himself. Yeah. He's sullen now. It's difficult to see into his eyes. And when one does, one sees they're filled with bitterness and hate. Mm. There's no trace of what I found in them before. And that spark worth saving. It's a pity. Yeah. Father. Oh, Mary... Well, how are you, sweetheart? Uh, you can go now, Doctor. Uh, good. I'll uh, I'll see him again tonight. Yeah. Well, it's like a breath of heaven to have you back here, Mary. Well, what's wrong, old girl? You look as solemn as an owl. What have you done with Robert Grandfather? Hmm? Who told you about him? Aunt Jenny told me everything. What have you done with him? Oh, now, now. Don't you worry about things you don't know anything about. He's all right. Everything's all right. Or will be. I want to know, Father. Where is he? In the dungeon. For what? Technically, for an infringement of the prison rules. Practically, to save his life. Oh, what good is it to save his life if you destroy him while you're doing it? Yeah, that's right, Mary. I thought of that myself. What can I do? His parole's lying here on the desk. It's taken me six months to get it. I want to get him out of here. I want to turn him loose. Well, then I can't. He's tied my hands. I can't. You can. You must. Yeah? What would you do? I'd set him free tonight. <laughs> Oh, you're just a kid. You don't know anything about these oh, things. Oh, but I do, I do. I'd set him free and then I'd fight for him. He's done nothing wrong. He's only doing what he thinks is right. It's what you think that counts. That's right. A man like you could find a way to save him. Delays and disagreements and whatnot. You'd get him off, Father. You know you would. Yes, and what would they do to me for that? Well, what does that matter if it's right? Right? You talk as if I'd done a crime myself. I've only done my duty all my life. My duty by the public and the law. I'm not a god. I've done the best I could for him. I'm through. I'm done. The law must take its course. Oh, no. No, you can't do that. You can't. What's gotten into you? What do you mean? 
Look here, what's back of all this? Come on now, sweetheart. Let's get right down to cases on this thing. What's up? I love him, Father. What? Is that on the level, Mary? Yes. Why didn't you tell me that at first? I wanted you to do it because it was right. Not just for me. I see. Well, uh... How, how long has this been going on? It hasn't gone on at all. He's never said a thing to me. But I've read in his eyes. That's why I went away to see, to find out just how much I cared. And whether it would make a difference to me that he'd been in prison. Well? Oh, no, it doesn't. I'm sorry to hate your father, oh, but... Oh, no, no, no. You can't help that, Mary. <laughs> Love? Well, you have to take it when and where it comes. You're not a child. What... What will you do? There's just one answer left to that, Mary. I turn the demons out of hell for oh, you. Father. Now, don't you worry, sweetheart. We'll see him through somehow, some way. Hello? Warden talking. Find Captain Gleason and tell him to send number 23499 up to my office. Yeah, that's right, 23499. Thank you, Father. Look sharp. I don't want to spend the night in here. Yes, sir. Yes, sir, Captain. You got a pocket flash? Yes, sir. Now then make a light. Like a pitch. There's a cell. Open up. Yes, sir. Come out here, you. Come out. You hear what I say? Get him out of there. He's laying down there in the corner. I think he's sick, Captain. Sick? He was all right an hour ago. Maybe, but now I think he's sick. Unconscious. You're nuts. Why should he be? Well, you know, you, you smashed him pretty hard today, Captain. I only hit him once, and with my fist. Go up and get Dr. Rinewood. I need the flashlight, Captain. All right, but hurry. Yes, sir. I don't want to be stuck here in the dark all night. Right back, Captain. He can't do anything with these muddy cuddle ways. A crook. Hey. What's that? Who's there? Who's there? Who's there? I... Yes, yes, I did. Send him up. It's Bob. He's on his way up. Father. Now listen, honey, he'll be changed, see? A week in the dungeon will change anyone. Now don't pay any attention to how he looks, do you hear? I won't, I won't. Is the car ready? It's waiting downstairs now. He'll be out of here in five minutes for good. Oh, thank God. Bob. Oh, come in, boy. Bob, come in. What have they done to Yeah, now, Mary. Oh, sit here, Bob, here. Yeah, thanks. No, uh, Bob, I'm sorry for what's happened. I've done the best I could for you. For everyone. Your parole has come. I'm going to send you out tonight. What? That's right, Bob. I've got it here, you see? Only came this morning. Oh, and uh, here's a pass to take you through the gate. No. I'm sure we'll beat them, Bob. I don't know how, but we'll beat them some way. No. It's too late. Too late? What do you mean? You say that. Please, I just killed him. Oh, God. What? Think what you're saying, boy. You couldn't. I killed him. I didn't know, you see. I thought he'd only come to torture me again. I couldn't stand it anymore. I didn't have the strength. He's come so many times to threaten me and beat me. I couldn't stand it anymore. I couldn't. Oh, God. I killed him. I'm not sorry. No one has any right to make another being suffer as I do in there. Father, father. Oh, I can't beat this, Mary. I can't. They know it now. They're looking for him in the yard. No, there must be no, somewhere, nothing, somewhere. Nothing, Mary, nothing. But well, it's just the way the things break sometimes. The way they break. Mary. Mary, 
look at me. I did my best. I did everything that I could. You sent him down there, down to that dungeon. Anyone would go mad in that place. He didn't know what he was doing. It's what I had to do. Don't you see that, honey? If I hadn't... If you hadn't sent him, he'd be free now. Free. Oh, no, Mary, don't. Please, you don't understand. Mary, look at me. Hello? Yes, doctor. Yes? He will. Yes. Are you sure? Yes, yes, I see. Now, well, keep me informed. Thanks. Gleason is going to live. Yes. He didn't know it was dark. The doctor told me an hour ago Gleason had a good chance. I didn't want to tell you, raise your hopes. But it's certain now. Well, what does that mean? Well, he's not a murderer, that's all. You'll have to stand trial again. Another five years added. Maybe ten. Ten years? Well, it's better than life. Or hanging. Warden. How did you get up here? I gotta see you, Warden. Right away. Hello? Yeah, yeah wait inside, Mary. What's your name? Galloway. Well? It's about Graham. You... You gotta let him go, Warden. You gotta let him out of that dungeon before something happens. Before something happens. Well, go on. He didn't kill Runch. He never touched him. I swear he didn't. Now, you were in here when Runch was killed. I... I did it. You? Yes, me. I'm telling you now, so you lay off the kid. Let him alone. Get him up out of there before... Before he knifes somebody. What? Well, you're too late, Galloway. You're an hour too late. He knifed Gleason down there an hour ago. Is... Is Gleason dead? No. Well, that won't help Graham much. But that boy was leaving here tonight. I have his parole on my desk. He was walking out of here a free man. And now he stays. Ten years. He'll never live it out. Ten years because you waited till it was too late. But he didn't kill Runs. I told He's you. He's young. Got his whole life before him. A chance for a home and kids. And what happens? He goes crazy mad in the dungeon of nice God. He didn't know what he was doing, but he pays for it just the same. Listen to me. He didn't kill Runs. And he didn't knife Gleason either, see? Because I did it. What? I did it. Yeah? What about Graham's confession? Uh, he was off his nut down there in solitary. Maybe he wanted to kill Gleason. Maybe he thought he did. Well, how could you have done it? I've got the run of the place, ain't I? I grabbed the key from the office. I left myself in the side door. I knifed Gleason. Do you know what you're confessing to? Sure. A man can only be hung once. Will you sign a statement? Any time you want. All right, Galloway. Go now. Report to Kurt. Right. Mary! Mary! Yes? Bob's free, Mary. He can leave any time. Please. Yes, he didn't do it, see? But he said... He didn't do it. He didn't know what he was saying. I'm letting him out now. Oh, well, it's all right, honey. It's all right. He's paid his debt more than paid it. He had a rotten deal, but now he's got a break, and we'll play it, honey. All of us. We'll play it the way it falls. <laughs> As John Hayward said some 400 years ago, of a good beginning cometh a good end. When tonight's star, who will be back with us a little later, was appearing on the stage in the racket, his leading lady was Gladys Lloyd. She still is. Only now her name is Mrs. Edward G. Robinson. A gracious hostess, a devoted mother, and one much interested in the cultural activities of the film capital. She's just returned from Europe with her husband, and as one who's been their guest several times, I'm delighted to reverse our positions and present Mrs. Edward G. Robinson. Thank you, Mr. DeMille. When I was in France, I met a doctor who told me of the time that you were very ill in Paris. He said that in your delirium, you kept repeating, Take me to paradise. I want to go to paradise. When I laughed, he looked at me in amazement. And then, of course, I had to tell him that what you were longing for wasn't a happy hunting grounds at all, but your ranch, paradise. <laughs> One must really visit Europe to appreciate Hollywood. Mm. All the culture found abroad flourishes right here in the shadow of the picture studio. Yes, Hollywood attracts the finest musicians, the most talented painters, and the greatest writers. Yes. In the Luxembourg galleries in France hang paintings by the Columbia director, Harry Lockman. Nor do the wives of stars and executives spend their time trying to justify their existence by balancing a, tea, balancing a teacup on one hand and a square-cut emerald on the other. <laughs> Mrs. Jessie Lasky is an excellent painter. Mrs. Ernest Boyd, a wife of the writer, is a director in the Pasadena Community Theater. 
Mrs. DeMille, wife of our host, is director of the Children's Hospital, the American Red Cross, and president of the Castellar Creche, a baby's home. And if you're not overcome with culture by this time, I might add that Mrs. Edward G. Robinson spends her time reading scripts, landscaping the garden, collecting rare china, and doing equally important chores, such as raising her two children. <laughs> and the rest of your time is your own, huh? Yes, only there isn't any. <laughs> Did you add to your collection while abroad, Mrs. Robinson? Well, Eddie did most of the collecting, Mr. DeMille. In Paris, he collected snails and frog's legs. <laughs> in Copenhagen, beer. And in London, pipes. I thought I knew Eddie pretty well by this time. But when we attended the showing of his picture, Bullets and Ballots, in Copenhagen, he floored me completely by getting up and making a speech in Danish. Maybe it was the beer. <laughs> <laughs> I know that it was a short speech and the people seem to like it, so I'm going to follow his example right now and say thank you all and good night. Good night, Mr. President. And now, a word from the other half of the Robinson household. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Edward G. Robinson. <laughs> Thank you very much. I better not make too good a speech or I might put my wife in the shade. <laughs> that wouldn't uh, exactly be discreet now, would it? Well, uh, as one husband to another, no. Well, now, look here. Maybe if I made a speech in Danish. No, no, huh? that, that, that's out, too. Huh? I, I'll take the blame by asking you a couple of questions. You're getting away from gangster roles, Eddie. Do you like it? Oh, <laughs> fine. Say, I was glad to go to England to make thunder in the city. In that, I play the part of an exploitation man in the story of American ballyhoo versus British conservatism. Mm -hmm. I've been a gangster so many times that I've seen people eye me suspiciously on the street and cross quickly to the other side. <laughs> one time, I tried to rent a house right here in Hollywood. The woman who owned it took one look at me through an opening in the door and not only refused to let me in, but threatened to call the police unless I left at once. <laughs> Dear, do you ever think of returning to the stage? Yes, but it doesn't look as if I will for some time, homesick as I am to get back on the boards, or even to see a few good shows. Hollywood, as Mrs. Robinson said, has a lot to be proud of, but I wish we had a couple of real Broadway theaters, don't you, Mr. DeMille? Yeah. For both the actor, though, and the listener, the Lux Radio Theater comes nearest to the legitimate stage. My thanks and congratulations. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you, Mr. Robinson. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your announcer, Melville Ruick. Mr. DeMille tells us of next week's program shortly. Our cast tonight included Walter Kingsford as Dr. Reinwolf, Lou Merrill as McManus, Earl Ross as Gleason, William Williams as Kellogg, Richard Abbott as Kurtz, Ernie Adams as Runch, Justina Wayne as Miss Brady, Joe Franz as Jim Fales, Hilda Haywood as Gertrude, Margaret Brayton as the operator, Ross Forrester as Jerry, David Kerman as the waiter, and Frank Nelson as Mike. Mr. Robinson and Miss Roberts appeared through courtesy of Warner Brothers, Mr. Guilfoyle, RKO, Mr. DeMille, Paramount, and Mr. Silver's 20th Century Fox, where he was in charge of music for the new Shirley Temple film, Stowaway. Once again, Mr. DeMille. If the letters you write us are any indication, no star has appeared in the Lux Radio Theater enjoys greater popularity than Jeanette McDonald. Her glorious voice comes to us again next Monday night in Tonight or Never, a play with music that ran on Broadway for more than 250 performances and was a tremendous success on the screen. Sponsors, the makers of Lux Flakes, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theatre presents Jeanette McDonald with an all-star cast in Tonight or Never. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. Hollywood. <laughs>